Well, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to you all to the IISS. My name is Antoine Levesque. I'm a research fellow for South Asia at the office here in London. We meet today to discuss China's responses to instability in developing countries. A couple of years ago, IISS colleague of ours, with plenty of relevant experience, wrote in our journal Survival that for now policymakers ought to be asking how does this play out with China? regardless of where they may sit and whatever their policy focus. Doing so requires understanding China's perceptions of its environment, its own approaches to risk-taking, and dilemmas which um, this poses for its policy makers. Secondarily, what are the institutions, behaviours and learning shaping those ideas as much as implementing them? Of all policy areas we could consider under the broad rubric of security and defense, how China specifically focuses on change and continuity overseas in tones of gray and with large amounts of unpredictability says something about the sort of power it seeks to be today and tomorrow. This also says something about what countries dealing with China can expect it and how they can possibly exercise some agency shaping China's thinking on those issues. Finally, there's a third set of stakes at play here. At a Wilton Park conference earlier this year on the Belt and Road Initiative, there was a call for more coordination between China and other international actors. But an important step is to get a better understanding of what shapes China's interaction with developing countries and how China responds to different situations. <coughs> To provide key policy-relevant perspectives on those questions, we are delighted to be launching today, this minute, uh, a new report looking at China and instability in developing countries. This has just been made available for free on the IISS website for you to download, read, take back into government and discuss on social media. The author of this report is with us today. Nicholas Crawford is Research uh, Associate for Conflict, Security and Development in the eponymous IISS Research Programme. Before joining the IISS, Nick worked on governance and stabilisation programming for developing countries. Since he's been with us, he's been looking at um, what the increasing involvement of other actors in developing countries means, especially China and Russia and he looks at how this may also uh, change their developing um, um, uh, their approach to development policy. Nick will speak for 20 minutes, following which our colleague Mayer, research fellow for Chinese defense policy and military modernization, will contextualize Nick's work from the point of view of expertise on China and um, military affairs. With this, um, I give the floor over to you, Nick. You have 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoine, and I echo his thanks to all of you for being here. Um, so, uh, as Antoine said, I uh, worked previously more on development and stabilization programming. Uh, so I'm, I'm not a sinologist, and, and this report is uh, written from that perspective uh, of international development and stabilization. And the experience of uh, working in that sector where some attention is paid to coordination with allies uh, between the UK, the US, Germany and so on in terms of how we do stabilisation and how we think about international development. Uh, but we think very little about the implications of the fact that uh, China is also present in a very big way in many developing countries, and increasingly so is, is Russia. In fact, China is now the largest source of lending uh, to developing countries, uh, and it's a very major investor too. So the purpose of this report is to sketch, uh, in general, uh, some things that we should take into account about China when we're, uh, when we're responding to uh, instability in developing countries, by which I mean both political instability uh, and economic instability. And the report uh, is in four sections. There's uh, a look at the context of uh, China's policy making uh, on its response to instability in developing countries. And we look at how it responds in general, 
there's a bit of an assessment of that response and some and drawing out some implications for uh, Western stabilization actors. So I'll just take you through some of those uh, uh, the key findings from those sections. And this research was done with a particular focus on uh, the instability currently in Venezuela and Zimbabwe. So some pretty contemporary cases, uh, and looking at how China has responded in those cases. But firstly, um, in terms of context and background. Um, it's important to note that obviously there are a lot of different Chinese state institutions involved in relations with developing countries. Um, not only is there the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, uh, the Ministry of Defence, um, there, there are also the policy banks, so the China Development Bank, the China Export Import Bank, uh, and various other state institutions. And then there are also the party institutions. And these also play a very important role in the relations with developing countries. And that includes the International Department which is res uh, of the CCP, which is responsible for a relationship between the Chinese Communist Party and its counterparts, other political parties. Uh, and indeed the United Front Works Department, uh, the Central Publicity Department, and so on. Having said that, in the last few years, that that constellation of Chinese institutions has become somewhat more centralised, uh, somewhat more coordinated, uh, not least due to the uh, elevation to the Politburo of uh, the head of the um, Office of Foreign Affairs of the CCP, and indeed the increased importance of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, with the elevation of the a Minister of Foreign Affairs to the position of State Councillor, so slightly more significant uh, in terms of uh, status than he was previously, giving him more, and his institution, more coordination power. I'd also point out that uh, Chinese institutions are, in, are better informed uh, about affairs on the ground in some of their partner countries than they were in the past. Uh, their presence is greater for a start, but also the amount of research done by Chinese researchers uh, is far greater than it ever was in the past. There is a boom in think tanks uh, in China, but um, in general there's also more engagement with, with partner countries as well. I mean, Chinese uh, foreign policy is shaped by a couple of key factors and as pertains to these relationships with unstable developing countries. And, and one key principle is, of course, the principle of non-interference. Now, this, the importance of that principle is actually contested, even within China, between Chinese scholars, uh, and how exactly that should shape Chinese policy is a matter of debate. And there are interesting terms used around... Um, constructive involvement and creative involvement to justify uh, exerting some influence over the domestic affairs of other states without uh, having to uh, explicitly undermine that principle. And I would say that the principle of non-interference serves more as a means of defence for China from interference by other countries in its own affairs and also a means of differentiating China from Western actors, uh, where Western actors are uh, responding to instability in developing countries. China's principle of non-interference, or the narrative of non-interference, differentiates China in an important way. And that's significant because China has the objective of having more influence in developing countries eh, around the world. I mean, it needs to, it has an interest in shaping international affairs uh, in China's interest and, and that plays out in, in its relations with unstable developing countries but, but overall I'd say that China has uh, four priorities which shape its relations with developing countries which face instability whether political or economic firstly to maintain and strengthen its relationship with those countries um, it wants to ensure that those countries remain open to Chinese businesses, uh, 
and that relations between the the country's governments uh, remain strong. Secondly, it's concerned to protect its businesses and financial investments, not just from uh, economic and business harms, but also from genuine security threats. Uh, Thirdly, as I say, it wants to maintain this narrative of non-interference because it has a central place in Chinese foreign policy. And fourthly, China seeks to project its influence around the world. So how does this bear out? What is China's response to instability in developing countries? Well, China looks in part to address the instability directly, to try to deal with some of the causes of instability. But China does also take steps to protect its interests in spite of instability. Uh, And you'll see how uh, these different responses serve both of those uh, goals. So firstly, what one might perhaps generously call it advice and technical assistance. Um, The advice that China offers is often based and certainly couched in terms of sharing Chinese experiences or uh, sharing Chinese solutions. And I would argue that uh, China has an increasingly well-defined solution for political stability. Uh, China is, of course, a a one-party state, and I think there is a genuine conviction that one-party rule plays an important part in political stability. But also important for political stability are development. So promoting development in unstable areas uh, promotes the legitimacy of the state in the eyes of the citizens, uh, but also social control. And, of course, uh, surveillance technology plays an important part in this. Um, uh, Control of the internet and media also play an important part. And China... China is exporting these surveillance technologies, and China is exporting, to some extent, this solution, Chinese solution for political stability. I'd say this... This is a matter of demand as well as supply. Many of China's partner countries are are authoritarian. Um, The cases of Zimbabwe and Venezuela are quite clear. And uh, Zimbabwe is a a good case. There is a a common interest in the use of social control to address uh, the threat of opposition the threat of dissidents, Uh, and indeed ZANU-PF and the Chinese Communist Party have held a number of exchanges on this uh, type, uh, on social control. So, for example, it has held, uh, uh, the CCP has held um, uh, trainings, uh, capacity buildings in how to Uh, monitor and manage public opinion, how to win the hearts of voters, how to mobilise the masses, and indeed how to use technology to deal with opposition threats. And this is also used in a number of other countries uh, besides. uh, In Ethiopia in the past, uh, in Uganda, um, there was a very good uh, BBC uh, investigation earlier this year which looked at uh, Huawei's training for... um, the Ugandan government on the use of its technology to surveil (coughs) and control uh, opposition communications. Uh, To some extent, this is the case in in Venezuela as well. Uh, Chinese technology has been used in the so-called Fatherland card, and that Fatherland card has been used to provide um, financial credit to individuals who rally voters for the government. Um, a second area of uh, resp- a second way in which China responds to instability in developing countries is ad- advice on economic stability, uh, advice on economic management. Uh, China has dispatched a large number of uh, policy advisors to um, to Zimbabwe to advise them uh, on a new economic strategy for the country. 
to try to deal with some of the causes of uh, well, economic mismanagement there. As you can see, it's had limited success. Uh, but this is a this is a response that is specifically targeted at uh, countries which are poorly economic man economically managed, and China seeks to provide some support to them um, to address those problems. Thirdly, uh, cooperation on security, security cooperation. Um, Chinese security cooperation is is a it's kind of part and parcel of Chinese diplomacy in many countries, and it's not always, and in fact, it's rarely an ad hoc response to instability. Actually, it's, it, but it has been used as an ad hoc response to instability in Pakistan, uh, in Uzbekistan, and in Kyrgyzstan, uh, where the uh, Chinese, where the People's Liberation Army and also the Chinese police have provided training to their counterparts in those three countries on addressing uh, terrorist threats. Uh, fourthly, reigning in financial support. Uh, as I said, China is now the largest uh, provider of lending to developing countries. But where countries are facing economic instability, China has tended to reduce its lending. This serves both to protect its own banks, its policy banks, um, but also it serves to apply some pressure to its partner governments to actually make the changes uh, they want to see. It, it's uh, reined in its lending to Venezuela and to Zimbabwe uh, and has done it to a number of other states besides in order to achieve that pressure. Uh, Pakistan is an interesting example. Uh, Pakistan has struggled to finance uh, its uh, public debt and the uh, Chinese government encouraged Pakistan to pursue support from other states and to pursue support from the IMF and withheld uh, lending until Pakistan did exactly that. But it has since been forthcoming with uh, an additional $2 billion in lending to support its short-term uh, debt financing requirements. In those states which are poorly managed economically. China also lends in a uh, slightly different way from uh, more stable states. In those states that are unstable, China tends to secure its loans against natural resources, and it tends also to use a lending mechanism which is sometimes described as circular loans. So these circular lo loans allow that uh, China agrees with a partner country such as Venezuela uh, that the that Chinese companies can undertake infrastructure works or uh, works of other kinds in Venezuela and those Chinese companies will be paid by Chinese policy banks such as the Export-Import Bank. A debt then accumulates between the Chinese policy bank and Venezuela in this case. It means that Chinese companies are not exposed to the economic risks of non-payment that are prevalent in places like Venezuela. And it means that the debt accumulates between the Chinese policy banks and the partner countries instead. In order to repay those loans, uh, as uh, Venezuela exports oil, the revenue from that oil, rather than going back into the Venezuelan uh, state coffers, goes directly into a Chinese escrow account, which means that it stays off, uh, off books in Venezuela and ensures that the uh, funds return to China in repayment of their loans. And this means that China is actually a lot less exposed to economic instability in some of the countries to which it lends money than we might initially assume. Chinese debts might be very large, but often they have the means of extracting repayment for them. Uh, next, China does reach out actively to opposition parties uh, where a country is politically unstable. In Venezuela, it has actively reached out uh, to speak uh, to the interim government under Juan Guaido, despite not 
siding with him. Uh, but the objective there is to ensure that uh, should there be a change of government, China's relationship with that country will still stand. And the say, uh, uh, for example, that the, the, the China-Venezuela joint fund remains in place. And the same uh, approach has been taken elsewhere. Uh, China reached out very actively towards the uh, Syrian opposition and indeed to the Libyan opposition and the National Transitional Council. Um, in, in assessment, I'd say that in general... China's response is quite successful at maintaining relationships between unstable countries and China. Uh, an exception to this would be in Libya. Despite reaching out to the National Transitional Council, it then rather undermined its uh, perceived neutrality, its, its, its overtures to the National Transitional Council by continuing to supply arms to the Gaddafi regime. China is still perceived as non-interfering, or at least less interfering than the West. Not by us, perhaps, but certainly by the recipient states. So again, I think it's been generally, generally successful at, uh, at uh, achieving what it set up to achieve there. And I think there's some evidence of Chinese in, uh, influence increasing as well. Uh, um, there, has, there have been... Diplomatic uh, demonstrations of support for Chinese counter-terrorism policies in Xinjiang and this, uh, this Chinese model of uh, political stability. But having said that, voting behaviour at the UN Security Council hasn't changed very much uh, where the UN Security Council is considering these situations in developing countries uh, where there is instability. Uh, generally, the, um, other states continue to align with the US the UK and France at the UN Security Council. Again, there are exceptions such as on the Democratic Republic of Congo um, at the end of last year or beginning of this year uh, when South Africa aligned uh, with China and Russia. But overall, in terms of its actual impact on stability, the, analyst, uh, the, the, the people I uh, interviewed for the research were, were pretty um, uh, firm in their conviction that China's activities in Venezuela and Zimbabwe have contributed to instability there. And indeed, there's some good quantitative evidence of this in terms of uh, Chinese uh, lending, uh, increasing uh, levels of corruption, both at a local level and national level, which in turn has an impact on stability. So, just to conclude quickly, uh, what are the implications then um, well, firstly, China and the West do have a common interest in the stability of developing countries um, because instability poses threats to uh, political, economic and security threats to Chinese interests there. But China's response, unlike the West, is not generally motivated by humanitarian concern but more in terms of the concerns I've, I've set out previously about maintaining its relationship and maintaining Chinese influence and protecting Chinese business interests. Uh, there's some philosophical agreement over how to achieve stability, um, but both China and the West are supportive of economic reforms that improve fiscal management, uh, improve the resilience of economies through uh, diversification of economies and creating business-friendly economic environments. And China also recognises the potential for using economic projects to reduce instability. It does so domestically, it doesn't yet do this in a targeted way overseas, and there may be some scope for cooperation in, in that regard. But China is reluctant to become too closely associated with any distinctively Western initiatives. So there may be scope for some experimentation with alternative trilateral cooperation mechanisms. Um, given the effort made to build relationships with the parties of government in other countries, China will typically have a preference for political transitions which represent more a rearranging of the deck chairs of governments rather than radical changes of government, because it's concerned with preserving those relationships. Um, and finally, 
And I've mentioned this previously uh, uh, earlier, in, earlier in my presentation, but I think the most concerning aspect for any Western policymakers is China's growing support for the use of social control to manage political instability in some of its partner countries, including both efforts to suppress and disincentivize opposition to the governments and the supply of, of surveillance, uh, because that does bring China into um, direct conflict, not only with the West, but also with the populations of some of these developing countries. Nick, thank you very much. May in the wind. Thank you, and thank you, Nick, for that really excellent presentation and putting so much work into a really important topic. I think it's a really great report with a lot of deep insight. Um, as Antoine mentioned, I work specifically on China's defense policy, military modernization, but I have a little bit of a, a, a personal link, I think, to uh, Nick's report, which is that I myself grew up in Tanzania. And I'm not going to say when that was, but I will say that when I was there uh, as a child and as a teenager, the Chinese were already present. So one thing that we need to remember about China's Belt and Road Initiative is that it's largely a uh, rebranded exercise in foreign affairs and foreign policy. China has been doing much of what Nick has written in his report for much longer than just the Belt and Road Initiative has been out there as a label and as a uh, foreign policy brand. Um, and I think that's important because when we talk about China's relationships with some of these developing countries that experience turmoil, that long-standing relationship is actually something that's being built on and is something that is ever-present in discussions. Um, it is not only uh, empty promises of uh, increased trade that are increasingly only one way. It is not, uh, China of course does actually build infrastructure uh, that countries desperately need. Um, so I think we need to be a little bit careful about the uh, negative, I'm not gonna say generalizations, but the negative aspects of China's relationship with, with a lot of developing countries. There is of course a lot of positive there, but of course there are risks. And what I particularly liked about Nick's research is that he hits on two points that I uh, have covered in, in my own research on the topic. And one is how China addresses the cause of instability, and second, of course, is how China um, protects its interests when instability occurs. Um, I've done a little bit of work uh, on the uh, digital Silk Road branch under the Belt and Road Initiative. And Indeed, China's uh, increasing export of surveillance systems is of serious concern. Uh, this is not, of course, only a concern from my perspective on um, the ability of authoritarian and non-democratic uh, in general regimes in developing countries to control narratives, um, to increasingly put pressure on activists, uh, the other part that I would, I'm more concerned with is um, the nature of the contracts that are signed for these types of projects with clauses in them that dictate that data will be sent back to China through Chinese servers. And that data collection at the end of the day will occur in China from these, uh, from these uh, contracts. And a clear example of that, of course, was um, the news report that broke out a couple of years ago that I'm sure you're all aware of, of China's fantastic gift to the African Union, the headquarter building in Addis Ababa, where it turns out after a few years, people realized that when uh, nobody was in the building at two o'clock in the morning, there were daily, or I should say nightly, uh, upsurges and uplinks of, uh, of, ch of data. Um, through Chinese servers at the end of the day to, uh, to Chinese uh, destinations. Um, so this form of data collection, of course, has espionage concerns. It also has concerns about China's ability to, ga to gather data that is increasingly global and international in, uh, in nature, which helps its own defense and civil military integration uh, innovation purposes. So that's, the, that's addressing the cause. Um, in terms of how China protects its investments abroad, another piece of research that I've done looks at Chinese um, use of private security companies um, in, uh, along the Belt and Road Initiative. And the report that I wrote uh, last year is called Guardians of the Belt and Road as well, free online. Um, but of course, that's not the point of this uh, presentation. Um, but what we found in this uh, piece of research that I conducted with a think tank in Berlin called Merix is that 
when China faces instability uh, along its investments abroad, uh, particularly in de developing countries that are either in conflict or coming out of conflict, China is not yet willing to secure those investments using the People's Liberation Army, the Chinese military. That would cause, again, reputational damage. As Nick has said, China has an interest in maintaining this good rapport, this reputation of being um, a, a partner uh, of development aid to countries in need. Um, using the PLA, putting boots on the ground, would actually uh, disrupt that and, and be of negative uh, consequence. So the use of private security companies is an interesting one for a military um, that doesn't have experience, where veterans come out of the military and start working in Chinese private security firms, going abroad, uh, providing consulting services. Remember that they are not private military companies in the way that we've seen the U.S. have private military companies. The Chinese say that they're totally different. Uh, these are not armed guards. These are not armed veterans. They are simply experienced people that go and offer their advice to Chinese companies. There have been cases where uh, these companies in, for example, South Sudan and Sudan, uh, whilst protecting Chinese infrastructure uh, projects, have come under fire, were unable to respond, um, and at the end of the day had to wait for government forces to help extract um, the Chinese civilians that have come under danger. So, of course, there's a, there's a dilemma here for the Chinese government. Do you rely on the PLA, which one needs experience? anyway to modernize and, and become that 2049 global fighting force um, but isn't ready to help protect Chinese investments yet? Or do you use private security companies who actually are drawn from that same pool of talent um, but are able to, at least for the moment, help maintain your reputation? Um, at the moment, it's the latter. In terms of my own questions that have come out of uh, Nick's presentation, if I may, um, I think a really interesting point that you made is about how China has a different financing model for a lot of these countries and that it actually, at the end of the day, if you look at the mechanics of it, faces a lot uh, a, a better situation than we might expect in terms of the risk mm -hmm. that, they, that, that comes out of these projects um, when the countries go into debt. I was wondering then how you see that changed rhetoric on China's part at the last BRI forum um, when uh, China has announced that its projects will be more, um, well, I guess give more agency to the local governments, will be more environmentally friendly and, and will have higher standards. Um, is that just empty rhetoric or is it actually concerned about how these projects will go? Um, and I think it also interesting would be to look at, to discuss a little bit how China's placement of high-level diplomats at UN agencies uh, affects the uh, norms and values, that the differences in norms and values that we have um, in the West on issues like human rights. Um, how, does that, how does that expanse, I guess, of China's high-level diplomatic uh, core in the UN then bring all of this into question? Thank you, Maya. Um, Nick, you have a nice menu of uh, supplementary questions. Let me um, add a comment and a question of my own. Perhaps you could start answering those three questions. The comment is that um, I would also um, really commend your report um, from the standpoint of my own work on the China-Pakistan economic corridor. I think that's a particular country where there are all sorts of considerations ranging from the general to the very specific but what that seems to me to do for China is, is really stretch the idea of a one-size-fits-all uh, solution to development finance and development um, perspectives in a broader political environment. So that's the comment. The question I'd like to put to you is um, more generally to do with the report. What do you think um, uh, is, is the, um, the uh, lesson you could, uh, you could draw from that in respect to um, the sufficiency or perhaps the need for new mm -hmm. channels to engage mm -hmm. China on its own development practices? Mm -hmm. If you're a Western um, policy planner sitting in London, Paris, New York, elsewhere, um, looking at bilateral cooperation or if you're looking at multilateral G20 type um, discussions or if you're an ambassador in country um, looking at what China is doing 
do you reckon that the findings of your report um, really um, elucidate a need for more diplomatic channels of engagement with China, or are the existing channels sufficient to really um, solve some of the uh, challenges which you described? Okay, over to you. Thank you, Rachel, and, and thank you, Maya, for your response. Um, uh, I'll go in reverse, and I'll start with, uh, with your question, Antoine. Um, uh, my sense from the discussions I've had and the interviews I, I carried out is that there, is, there are quite limited channels of communication. Uh, one, to discuss um, particular situations as they play out in terms of political instability uh, and, to a lesser extent, economic instability uh, and political crises as they mount. <coughs> Um, secondly, that there are limited but um, growing channels of communication on development practices, not necessarily on a bilateral basis, but more usually on a basis of um, there's, there is more interaction between the Chinese policy banks and multilateral policy banks uh, between the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, the IMF, um, uh, which others. Also, uh, France's uh, National Development Bank, uh, and indeed, to a lesser extent, Germany's National Development Bank, uh, KFW, uh, with yeah, with the Chinese lenders. So there, there is some uh, there is some dialogue there, but as yet, there's there are no substantive uh, cooperative programs of lending. Um, I do think there is scope for that. Um, as for whether it's needed, I, I, uh, particularly on the political crisis, I think, yes, I, I definitely think there is room for more uh, discussion and coordination. Um, coordination is perhaps overstating it, at least understanding each other's positions better. Thank you. Um, in with, uh, placement of Chinese diplomats at a high level in the United Nations. Well, this report, and I should have said this, this report focuses on the bilateral activities of China. Uh, so, you know, China contributes quite significantly to uh, peacekeeping missions, UN peacekeeping missions. In fact, it's the largest permanent member of the UN, largest contributor of peacekeepers among the permanent members of the UN Security Council. But this has focused on the on China's more bilateral activities. So I, I find it hard to answer the question of uh, what influence they're having on the UN. But I think that's a really interesting question uh, for further investigation. But I can answer in more depth on on China's uh, on the potential change in China's lending practices. Uh, China's upsurge in lending took place around 2003, 2004, and it really took off from there. It coincided with the going out policy, uh, which was about uh, encouraging Chinese businesses, including state-owned enterprises, to expand overseas. Um, and Chinese lending at that stage was extremely liberal, uh, free-flowing, uh, with very few conditions and very few feasibility studies. But the point of that lending was to support the expansion of Chinese businesses overseas and to create some of the infrastructure to facilitate those Chinese investments. Over time, the, re the requirements of Chinese lendings have evolved somewhat. China has staked its reputation on the Belt and Road Initiative and its success. Uh, China is, seeks to be influential as, as well. And, uh, and actually, I think China, is, uh, China also has the experience of countries defaulting on its loans uh, and has found that some of the projects for which it has lent money are not as profitable uh, or economically viable as they uh, thought they might be. And so my sense is that Chinese lending practices are changing um, in terms of uh, the amount of uh, assessment that is required as to the feasibility and the impact of its, uh, of its loans. And so we've seen in, in South Africa 
China imposed certain conditions on its lending to the state-owned energy company, ESCOM. We've seen it uh, withholding lending for the third phase of the railway, the standard gauge railway in Kenya, because of concerns about its feasibility. And also it's withheld funding for a railway in Ethiopia and a number of other projects besides. So there is a change in lending practices, I think. But that doesn't change the fact that it, it still uses these uh, circular loans uh, in order to um, uh, reduce the risks of non-payment to Chinese companies. Mm. And so the Chinese state takes on that risk instead. But, so yeah, I agree there are some changes. Thank you, Nick. The floor is now open for questions. I know there are a number of uh, experts and uh, even serving officials among you um, in the audience, so please make yourself known and please ask a question. Sir, at the back. Um, <coughs> thanks a lot. Um, Ewan Grant, I'm a former uh, law enforcement intelligence analyst who's worked on World Bank and European Commission programs in developing countries. In including Kyrgyzstan before the growth of Chinese influence, and more recently Tanzania, where I saw very clearly how the tax system is heavily skewed to the influence of Chinese trade. So my question is, uh, in, res uh, in relation to the outstanding points you've made, who is listening to your message in the Western developmental communities as opposed to foreign affairs and security. Different, their equivalents, I think I've seen the answer actually in your favor, yeah. and major, <laughs> no, no, no. major um, charitable development institutions. Frankly, I don't think they really have got a grip on this. I've still got to download Wolf Warrior 2, I haven't done that yet. Um, well, actually, I, I'd say that the I, I do have some positive engagement with uh, Diffid's of servants on exactly this issue. And in fact, just after I started work on this, uh, they specifically asked me to provide a, a summary, a one pager of the three key points to take into account about China when they're doing stabilization programming. Stabilization programming, not general development programming, I grant you. And so, I produce a 17,000 word report, but there is a two page executive summary at least. Um, so, there is, there is an interest in, in the topic. Uh, I have to s admit that earlier this year, the stabilization unit issued its new um, sort of doctrine, uh, guidance document on uh, building stability overseas. It's not called that, that was the previous one, but anyway. And there is no explicit mention of um, how to think about how to cooperate with or bear in mind that there are other external actors on the ground where they're trying to do stabilization programming and I, I think that's uh, a problem because if you look at stabilization programming in, in Syria or Libya or many other countries what the UK and US and other allies have sought to do has been undermined by other external actors but I think there's growing recognition of that and certainly ample recognition of the importance of China as a, as a player in international development. Thank you. The gentleman... I, I will not work on a ministry of defense. Do you see any evidence or where do you see the, the, the driver for China's response and stability in terms of is it really just economics only? You know, the profit? Or do you see any evidence that they sort of take positions that are only take it out of political reasons, so let's say if the U.S. has, or the West has a position in a particular region, they just simply take the opposite. Uh, and I guess more broadly, I'd be curious, how far do you, would you say that the party is willing to put their fingers on the scale in regions of instability um, as far as, potentially going as far as supporting armed groups to, you know, supporting uh, political parties that more support Beijing state armed groups? Mm. Um. I'll respond, but I wonder whether I might have a response as well. Um, but in terms of its public diplomacy, China always uh, remains essentially neutral. Um, if you look at um, its statements at the UN Security Council, 
its objections to intervening in any conflict are couched in, in two terms. One, um, we shouldn't interfere in the domestic affairs of other states. Uh, we're not taking a position on whether the government or the opposition are right. We're just saying we shouldn't interfere. And the second thing is any interference, any intervention would result in chaos. Uh, uh, t- that word has actually been used several times. Um, so in terms of public diplomacy, I don't think we can expect China in general to take a, a stance on any political crisis. Um, but in terms of activity and its response, I mean, as, I, as I say, the, the CCP does provide support to its political parties in other countries to um, help shore them up um, in terms of in terms of training and capacity building um, but in order to support Chinese goals I, I, I'm not sure because China well also this is an important point which I didn't make earlier actually China's relationship with many developing countries is pretty secure regardless of the outcome of a political crisis because partnership with China is pretty indispensable for many countries in terms of uh, its willingness and ability to lend large sums of money for infrastructure projects, which Western states generally are not willing to do, especially where they're more risky, and because of the particular expertise that some Chinese state and enterprises can offer. So I think in general China rests easy on the assumption that one some kind of relationship will persist even if there is significant political change Uh, and two it reaches out to the opposition as I said earlier to ensure that if there is a big political change that relationship persists so in response to the first bit of your question which is what motivates China's response I think it is primarily Yes, uh, preserving Chinese economic and business interests and preserving that relationship with the state and ensuring they remain open to Chinese businesses. Um, As I say, I don't think it is a matter of humanitarian concern. And that also shapes the fact that where the West, where the West, um, whether it's different or foreign office or indeed in the US, often wants to respond very quickly to a crisis because it's concerned to... Uh, minimize the humanitarian consequences of a, of a crisis, China is more willing to wait things out. Thank you. Aya, do you have anything I to add? I think that's a really great question. Um, I think one thing that we shouldn't underestimate um, and forget whether you believe it or not is um, China's rhetoric on um, becoming a mediator in certain conflicts is one that's also driven by its own view of itself as a great power. Right? This is something that it thinks it has the right to do and is it a really good place to do because it's never been a country that's interfered in others, uh, in other countries' um, domestic affairs. So it feels that, that it plays that neutrality quite interestingly now as a mediating role. But what I found a particularly interesting uh, example of where this hasn't really quite yet been resolved within China was... Um, a couple of years ago when there was a discussion by a Chinese senior envoy to Syria about whether China would um, assist by sending the PLA in stabilizing Syria after after the war was over. And there was this fantastic banter that you could follow, well, you could look it up, uh, in Chinese press with this envoy saying, yes, this is absolutely our policy, and Beijing going, no, it's not. Uh, we don't, we're not actually going to do that. That's not our policy at all. We're not going to interfere in this in this situation. It's it's up to the Syrians and and, and their domestic uh, and their domestic stakeholders. Um, so whereas yes, China wants to be a mediator and wants to play a greater role, it's not really figured out how to do that yet. In terms of arming uh, certain factions within countries and in stable regions, um, I agree that China's main arms arms trade is is a separate issue, but arms. Um, I guess military diplomacy, defense diplomacy with countries is done to a state, right? Um, the problem with Chinese arms sales, of course, is that it's inscrupulous. It sends it sells arms, and UAVs are a prime example of this, to whoever can pay 
whoever want, would like to buy them without any strings or conditions attached. So where those end up in a conflict is another matter altogether where China goes, well, we've washed our hands of this and it has actually nothing to do with this. Um, the problem, of course, for China will be the day that a Chinese UAV is used against a civilian, uh, against civilians, uh, the day that I suppose a, uh, a school is bombed through the use of a Chinese UAV that ended up in an armed uh, non-state group's hands, um, and how China then deals with the reputational damage that Western defense primes have had to face um, in similar scenarios. Thank you. Our next question is from Antonio Sampaio, Double I Double S. So, Antonio from Double I Double S. You've mentioned that um, Chinese aid can sometimes be vulnerable or exploited uh, through corruption in both local and national instances or institutions. Um, could you tell us if this is something that is particularly um, related to the nature or character of Chinese aid? or if this is sort of the same sort of corruption risks that um, pertains to other aid organizations? That, that's a very good question. Um, no, the, the, there, are, there are two studies that, that look at this. Um, I'm trying off the top of my head to remember the names of the authors, but I can't, but it's in the report, so there you go, you can read the report. Um, but uh, those studies do compare Chinese aid to Western aid, and the corruption effects are present in uh, Chinese aid, but not in Western aid. This is a, a study of relatively recent uh, um, international development aid. So there were absolutely a lot of problems uh, in the past uh, with Western aid fueling corruption, but uh, recognition of that fact has led to certain alterations in practices. And so... In answer to your question, there is a difference in practice which uh, contributes to this. So one of the ways in which uh, Chinese aid contributes to uh, corruption is um, that the... So Chinese aid is disproportionately directed towards the hometowns of the leaders of the countries to which it's leading, uh, lending money. And they can do that because China doesn't uh, impose many conditions on its, on its lending. And where Chinese money is directed is primarily controlled by the partner states. So it's not that the Chinese companies or the Chinese uh, banks are corrupt. It is that they are perhaps unwittingly facilitating corruption at a national level. And equally at a local level with local subcontractors in terms of levels of bribery and, and so on. So there is a there is a difference in practice, um, and uh, maybe this is one area in which uh, China will make changes in, in the future, uh, because that corruption has led to criticism of opposition to Chinese lending in many developing countries, Zambia perhaps most notably. Thank you. We are eight minutes to the end of our time. Um, I do have a question for you, um, and I'd like to call on anyone else to ask a final question before we close the list. But the question to you in the immediate um, instance is, um, is, can you locate for us in the Chinese system a space where there is learning and accumulation of experience happening? Because it seems to me that if China is going to adapt institutionally to um, environments in different countries and geographies, it's going to have to adapt the models uh, which are primarily top-down, state-driven to um, uh, shape uh, or adopt the shape of those situations. Mm. Where is the repository of that experience and that, um, that accumulation of, of wisdom from overseas experiences, hmm. if any? Uh, that's a, another really interesting question. Um, it, you know, to some extent, it's, it's, it's uh, difficult to me to, for me to say which state institutions are, are uh, gathering that learning because they're not necessarily transparent about that, but um, certainly you see it within the Chinese um, think tanks. Um, one good example is the 
uh, Shanghai Institute of International uh, Studies, mm -hmm. uh, which has contributed to a number of, of studies on uh, instability in developing countries and China's relationship to developing countries. And the lessons being learned among Chinese research institutes are, are more obvious, more transparent, because they're publishing. So I can you can see that learning accumulating. And uh, those think tanks have varying degrees of relation, close relationship with uh, Chinese state institutions. Some, have, some are closer than others. Um, but I would expect that there is a, de a decent degree of learning within Chinese state institutions on this as well. And, and I think that is reflected in their policy pronouncements and some changes in practice. I have a two-finger uh, addition to that. Um, you said that there is a centralization and a, a greater control mm. over uh, China's bilateral relationship with developing countries, and particularly countries that are currently facing instability, which are you know of the most concern yeah. um, to China's interests. Um, how do you how do you rectify this learning and this publication, this increasing publication? You said growth of the number, increase in the number of think yeah. tanks when this. You know, with this harder control by President Xi Jinping to really dictate the narrative that China, China yeah. pushes forward in the world. Yes, it's interesting that that kind of boom in the number of think tanks happens earlier in the 2010s, uh, and more recently, their ability to publish freely, discuss freely, criticize freely has been um, uh, more limited. Um, but that doesn't necessarily stop conversations from happening even if public criticism isn't there and even so if you look at the uh, if you look at academic works um, from the last two three years there is still considerable debate for example on the issue of non-interference and whether this is a good principle uh, for China or not so yes it's more centralized and also the Chinese Communist Party has a, a the, the role of the Chinese Communist Party in China's foreign policy has been strengthened and its role in many of the institutions which uh, are involved in relations with developing countries has, has, has uh, strengthened. Um, but even so, I think there's still that space, some space for learning. Certainly from my experience and conversations, I think the IDCPC is one place where that sort of learning could potentially be taking place and also the National Development and Reform Commission, which sits at the interface between the domestic and the, uh, and the foreign um, perspective. Our hour is now up. Um, I'd like to thank all of you, but also thank especially our speaker and author, report author, um, Nick Crawford, for a very thought-provoking uh, discussion. And please join me in thanking Nick and Maya for their contributions today. <laughs>